Good day, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia. I am very proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2023-2024 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. This lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA College of Arts and Sciences, the UVA School of Data Science, and through a grant through the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. Since 2016, the Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series has focused on the use of data science methodologies, artificial intelligence, deep learning, and statistical modeling as they pertain to different themes in the biomedical and health sciences. Our theme this year is focused on building of partnerships for generative AI training in biomedical and clinical research, where every Friday we enjoy a range of leading thinkers um, speaking about the issues, promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with the emerging uh, ideas and methods behind AI-based applications in biomedical science. Participants selected for our biomedical data science uh, innovation Lab program will leverage these seminar presentations as vital material in our culminating in-person manuscript and grant project development workshop to be held at the Bahia Beachfront Resort located in sunny San Diego, California in June of 2024. We are excited for this year's uh, program. It's very engaging and a way to bring together AI platform developers, biomedical researchers, and university-level educators to better understand the power, promise, and potential perils associated with the generative AI explosion. Today, I am delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Roxana Danishu from Stanford University School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Danishu is an assistant professor of biomedical data science and dermatology at Stanford. She studied bioengineering at Rice University before matriculating to Stanford, where she completed her MD and PhD in genetics uh, under Russ Altman as part of the medical scientist training program. She completed a dermatology residency at Stanford as part of a research track and completed her postdoc at the biomedical data uh, in biomedical data science uh, with James Liu, who uh, James Zhu, excuse me, who was a prior speaker um, in our seminar series. She currently is assistant director of the Center for Excellence in Precision Health and Pharmacogenetics and Director of Informatics um, at the Stanford Skin Innovation and Interventional Research Group, and a founding member of the Translational AI and Dermatology Group, and a faculty affiliate in Human-Centered AI and the AI Medicine and Imaging Centers. Uh, her research lab focuses on the application of fair and transparent artificial intelligence for healthcare. So her topic today, um, entitled Generative AI for Healthcare, is right in line with our theme of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series for this year. Uh, she will remind us that generative AI has the potential to revolutionize healthcare. Uh, in her talk, she's going to discuss the potential applications of large language models in healthcare, while also reviewing their biases and pitfalls. As always, we are streaming this lecture live and we're recording via YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us once again. Also, our specially selected 2023-2024 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants, as well as alumni, are encouraged to submit any questions they have via the chat feature in their YouTube sessions. I'll be synthesizing these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of the lecture. And with that, welcome, Roxana. We are really excited to be hearing from you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna, uh, you know, <laughs> so just a bit, a little bit of background on top of that excellent introduction. Thank you so much. Um, I am both, you know, trained in the data science realm and clinically. And in fact, in addition to running my research lab, is which is what I spend the majority of my time doing. I do see patients uh, half a day a week. Actually, my clinic day was yesterday. And so what that allows me to do is really understand the problems in medicine from being at the front lines, but also understand what could happen if something goes wrong with how we use these AI tools. And I think, you know, that clinical, that real clinical experience um, colors everything that I do um, within my research. So I am a dermatologist by training. And while I work across AI in all of healthcare, um, there is a bit of a dermatology focus because that's what I'm clinically most aware of. So why, what, why are we having this revolution of AI in healthcare? You know, um, I think most of us can agree 
that the healthcare system is broken in many, many ways. And I like to always ground things in an example. So pretend that you're at the beach and you're relaxing and enjoying the sun. Hopefully you're wearing sunscreen. And one of your friends says, hey, what's that on your back? And, you know, because it's on your back, it's not something that you don't, you look at very often. And you notice this lesion and you don't remember seeing it before. And so that, that makes you a little bit concerned because you know that if you have some sort of new growth that you should probably get it checked out. It looks a little strange. What is it like in our American healthcare system right now if that happens? Um, if you have a primary doctor, which many people these days are even having trouble getting into a primary doctor, um, maybe you first you call your primary doctor to get an appointment. Um, this could take days to weeks. I know for me, sometimes if I need to get into my primary care doctor, it the next available appointment is not for a couple of weeks. Um, a primary doctor sees you uh, and says, yeah, I agree. This is new. This is maybe like what I should get. You should probably get it checked out and refers you to a specialist, a dermatologist. Let's assume you live in an area that actually even has a dermatologist because there are many parts of this country where there's not a local dermatologist. And I have patients who drive in from two, three hours away to come see me. And so, you know, you get a referral to dermatology and then the wait for that can be three to six months, even longer. Anybody here who's had to see any specialist, be that a dermatologist, a cardiologist, knows that it is a long wait. And then of course you have all these issues like does your insurance cover the care as a doctor and network? So at the end of the day, you feel like screaming. And I have to say that even as a healthcare professional who understands this system inside and out, who has, you know, friends in almost every single specialty, who knows people that I can email, that I can text whenever I have needed healthcare for me or my loved ones, I still feel like this at the end of the day. It's so difficult to get in. There's a backlog. Physicians are burned out. It's hard to get into specialty care. The system is just broken. And so the idea has been that artificial intelligence could maybe help streamline things. Now, there's always been this tension about AI replacing physicians versus the way that I see things, which is AI aiding physicians. Um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, sort of spicy um, news headlines like AI is better than dermatologists at diagnosing skin cancer or very famous a statement by Andrew Ng about radiologists, should radiologists be worried about their jobs? This statement was made in 2017. It's now 2024. Radiology is a very popular specialty, still competitive. We have shortages, you know. Uh, as it stands right now, despite what impressive things that AI can do, it is nowhere close to being able to practice medicine. However, it would be very nice for it to be able to help streamline things or make non-specialists better so that, you know, some people might not need specialist care if they're able to sort of take care of their needs in the primary care space um, with enhancement from AI diagnostics. Um, and there's, of course, this whole direct to consumer slant, which I won't talk about deeply today, but happy to discuss in the Q and A because I think it's a very interesting space about you know tools that are given directly to patients, uh, such as like you can now use Google Lens to look up your skin conditions and what does that mean for the practice of healthcare. So specifically today, I'll be talking about generative AI. And generative AI has really just, you know, 
broken in and, and has become very popular. So I actually asked uh, Dolly to make an image of a melanoma. I just asked, like, show me a melanoma. It was very interesting, the image that it generated um, to me. It's kind of very cartoonish. Um, I'm not sure why there's a pencil in there. Uh, we do say that lesions greater than a pencil eraser is something that, you know, we're concerned about, but it was a little bit random there. And then I also, um, asked, uh, chat GPT, you know, tell me how generative AI can impact healthcare. And I think it gave a pretty exhaustive list of all the different ways that generative AI models could impact healthcare from drug discovery to synthetic data generation. Um, that was, this is very interesting, like organ generation. I mean, I think some of these things are probably a little bit of a stretch, but again, like if you have played with previous uh, GPT models, like GPT-2 and GPT-3, then you know that GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 were essentially a monumental leap forward in the capabilities. I mean, I remember where I was when GPT 3.5 came out during the NARIPS conference. I was with some colleagues who said, hey, you should check out GPT 3.5. And I remember running back to my hotel room. And the first thing I did is ask it a bunch of medical questions, which GPT 3 had failed on. And all of a sudden GPT 3.5 was doing an amazing job in comparison with still some significant limitations. But I do want to acknowledge that really there has been a significant leap in capabilities um, across these generative AI modalities. So generative AI has the potential to really impact healthcare. And here uh, today I'll be talking about both about computer vision and large language models. But really a lot of the excitement in this space has been around large language models. Um, you're already seeing situations where Epic and Microsoft have partnered to bring GPT-4 to the electronic health record. Other companies like Google is already testing their large language model in the hospital system. To be completely honest, it's been a little bit shocking to me how quickly things have moved because healthcare in general, um, for better or worse, moves very slowly when it comes to technology um, adoption. And I do think that that, you know, again, for better or worse, worse because it maybe takes longer to get things that are actually useful into the healthcare system, better because you don't really want to move fast and break things in the healthcare system, because mistakes and errors lead to problems and patient has a real human impact on patient well-being. Um, but it's really been shocking to me how quickly this has moved, um, given that, you know, GPT 3.5 came out in like November of, I believe, 2022. And now we're already talking about integration into the healthcare system. And there haven't been like, you know, extensive prospective clinical trials. There's not really good evaluative frameworks for understanding whether or not a model is working or failing. Um, there's a lot of very, uh, like a large number of unanswered research questions about how to evaluate these models and their efficacy. And yet things are kind of moving already into the healthcare realm. So today I'm gonna talk specifically about four different stories um, of generative AI in healthcare. The computer vision stories are more on the research side. They're about auditing computer vision and uh, models in healthcare, um, augmenting computer vision with synthetic images. And the large language models are much more, uh, stories are much more translational and application-based. Um, talking about this survey study we did to find out how physicians are using large language models um, and then talking about how at Stanford, we ran this red teaming event, multidisciplinary red teaming event uh, to 
try to find vulnerabilities of large language models in healthcare. So we'll start with computer vision. And so, you know, people are building all sorts of computer vision AI tools, things that can predict different. So, you know, models that can look at a chest x-ray and predict whether there's a pneumonia there. Models that look at skin lesions and can predict, you know, whether a skin lesion is a skin cancer or not. The issue is that most of these models are black boxes. Um, they're using deep neural networks. And we don't really understand whether or not they're using uh, clinically relevant features in their decision making or possibly using spurious correlations that you don't want to be used by the model. Um, a good example of that is that with skin lesions, it's been found that it, you know, when we biopsy a skin lesion that we think is skin cancer, many times we take a purple marker and we draw a line around it. And models were actually using the presence of a purple marker to increase the probability of saying something was a malignancy. So that's a spurious correlation. That being said, that's also something medical students and residents use whenever their senior attending physicians show them an image and say, hey, I, what do you think about this lesion? If they see a purple marker, they know, hey, I think this was biopsied. I should say, you know, that this is more likely to be a malignancy. So anyway, what again, with humans and with models, you really want to make sure that spurious features like a purple marker are not what's being used to um, make the assessment of what the lesion is. And so explainable interpretable AI allows humans to be able to understand what factors influence the algorithm's decisions. Is it stripes that help tell the, you know, the model that this is a zebra versus a horse or like the examples I gave earlier for healthcare? A lot of explainable AI methods um, have, such as saliency maps, have looked at trying to identify what pixels are most important in the model's decision making. And while these saliency maps make for these beautiful constellations of, you know, pixels, they don't really tell you much about um, what's really being used. Like, I don't quite like for the first first or like last lesion, I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Is it picking up for the last lesion, like the pigment networks? Is it using that information? Um, it, what What is it actually like the clinically relevant features that it's using in a language that I as a clinician can understand? And because of this, we developed, we decided to develop an alternative way to try to assess models, reasoning processes using generative AI. And in fact, this methodology was previously used in facial with, a, you know, facial recognition tasks. Um, so there was a, uh, there was a paper that came out in iClear uh, called uh, Explanation by Progressive Exaggeration, meaning that they would make changes to a feature in the image to see how it impacted um, the ability of say facial recognition models to, uh, to identify an image. And so what they could do is that they could change a feature such as not use generative AI to change a feature such as smiling or not smiling. So we took that methodology as sort of the foundation um, this was done with, in collaboration with our uh, with University of Washington and a very talented graduate student, um, Alex DeGrave, who's actually an MD PhD student, um, and decided to modify this to use generative AI to create counterfactuals. What does that mean? So you start with a reference image of a skin. This is a skin lesion, and you train a model a generative AI model that makes changes to the uh, reference image in concert with a model. So you have a model that you want to test. So it's not, you're not, you, you're starting with a classifier model, let's say um, 
I'll, I'll just use the name. So we have a model called Deep Derm. Um, and Deep Derm is a model that uh, that identifies skin cancer, which is malignant, um, versus not skin cancer, which is benign, right? So we take Deep Derm and we take a reference image. So that's a real image. And Deep Derm gives some probability that this reference image is malignant or a skin cancer, okay? Now we train a new model, a generative AI model that is able to take this reference image and make changes to it in a way that's realistic such that now Deep Derm sees the image as either more benign or more malignant. And so in this case, you can see that the more benign image has fewer colors in it. It's like not, uh, the lesion looks more even. Um, it doesn't have as much atypical pigment network. So this new generative AI model is able to take reference images and some existing model that makes predictions and able to produce or generate counterfactuals of that reference image that make it more benign to our model of interest, deep term, or more malignant to our model of interest. So now what we can do is we can do this across many images and start, you know, many different models. So you can build a generative AI model for each different classifier that we have. And in each case, it can create a series of images that look more benign and more malignant to that classifier. And once that we've done this across many, many, many images, we can have experts look at these pairs of images and identify what are the differences between those images. And in, a, in clinical terms, in terms that are clinically relevant. And what that does for us is it actually tells us what features are these models using to make that decision in a language that is interpretable to clinicians. And as we did this across thousands of images, we were able to reveal factors that influence AI decision-making. Some of the things are, are factors that um, are promising in the sense that, yes, that's exactly what you would hope the model is using. Things like darker pigmentation or numbers of colors or um you know blue white veil which is actually a finding in melanoma it's a like you can see it's this like whitish green but some of the things um some of the things are not are, are actually concerning like you wouldn't expect that a pinker background so b here stands for background l stands for lesions we looked at both uh, lesion characteristics and background characteristics. So skin looking a little more pink, maybe if that pink means sun damage, but uh, you know that's that could be a little concerning. Um, hair in the background skin uh, shouldn't really have that much of an impact on you know the output of the model. Uh, so we what we did is we actually tested several different models and we compared it to, we looked at how each factor influenced whether the lesion was predicted to be more benign or more malignant and we also compared it to the literature and what you can see here with the colors is that different model you know of course each model has been trained differently on a different data set a different training data set some of these models are open models some of these models were actually models that are um, uh, direct to consumer like cell phone models. So we tested some of those too, meaning that there's actually already humans who are using it. And what we found is that, you know, sometimes models do share uh, features like many of them use darker pigmentation, many of them use number of colors and that's appropriate. But some models really focus on things that maybe they shouldn't focus on such as background hair. Like there's one model that uses background hair a lot um, and it shouldn't do that. Um, and so 
this whole methodology of generative AI actually gives us new insights into how the models are working and whether or not they're using appropriate or inappropriate features. And you can imagine that if your model is using some spurious correlation to make its decision, that should be sort of a clue to you as a model developer that maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and get more training examples to try to kind of flush out that spurious correlation. Um, so that's sort of how we used generative AI to do something what I, which I thought was pretty interesting, uh, which is actually kind of figure out what clinically relevant features the models are using um, to make their decision. So that was our first, that's my first story. Um, my second story in computer vision has to do with the use of synthetic data, not to audit models, but to actually train models. Um, as we know, data in healthcare is very much protected as it should be. What I am showing here on this uh, figure, it's a figure from a paper that we published in JAMA Dermatology in 2021. We looked at 70 different AI in dermatology research papers and assessed whether the data sets that they were used, we were, we were looking at the features of the data sets that were used. And in this figure, we show whether those data sets were shared and open data sets or closed off and siloed data sets. And so what you can see here is that every purple square represents a research paper while every circle represents a data set, the larger the circle, the larger the data set. Each red circle means that the data set is proprietary. It is not shared. No one has access to it other than the authors. And the green circles represent open shared data sets. And unsurprisingly, and this is probably true in, you know, in the fields other than dermatology and as well, most of the data sets that are being used to develop AI that's published are siloed, are not available to share, um, and lead to like one-off papers. I will point out that number one is the International Skin Imaging Collaboration uh, data set, which is one of the largest open data uh, sets in dermatology. Um, and it's led to a proliferation of research around it. But what this means is that because most data is siloed, when people are building models, they don't have access necessarily to large amounts of data, and in particular for things that might be more rare. And so our question, um, and again, this was done with a very talented student in collaboration with Harvard, um, uh, Luke Sagers, and we, we, we looked at using how, you know, there's all these augmentation methods in deep learning, things like cropping the images, things like rotating them or introducing some kind of Gaussian noise, uh, even interpolation of uh, images. But our question was, what about using synthetic images as a way of augmentation? Um, and as a dermatologist, so if you have ever seen me talk before, you know that many of my talks center around bias in AI and that, you know, I have published work showing that models in dermatology do not work as well on lesions, uh, uh, lesions on brown and black skin because these models haven't been trained on images of brown and black skin and the largest data oh, publicly open data sets, including the one that I mentioned, um, almost exclusively have images of skin lesions on white skin, meaning that the training data is not representative of the human diversity of skin tones. And one thing I've often heard is, oh yeah, the way that we could solve this problem is by using synthetic data. Um, and so, my take, uh, my hope, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you our results and then I'll kind of tell you what my key takeaway is from this. So that was actually kind of the impetus for us doing this study is that people kept saying like, hey, we could use synthetic images to augment models, particularly in situations where we don't have 
um, diverse skin tone representation. So what we found, and I'll just try to orient you here. So what we looked at model performance here uh, with and without image transformations uh, in addition to using synthetic images, here at the top, the number represents the number of real images in per a class. So 16 real images, 32 real images, 64 real images. And within each box, we're increasing the number of synthetic images. And so what you see here is that you, as you increase the number of synthetic images, yes, you do boost your accuracy of performance. Um, and, but, you know, one thing you do is that having 64 real images is much better than having, you know, the synthetic images leads to a boost, but the real images are kind of, are kind of the most key aspect. And the reason I kind of make this point is because what that means, especially if you're trying to use synthetic images to, um, to address bias, is that you can actually create a situation that continues to be biased. Because if you say, oh, all my lesions on white skin are real, and 50% of the training set of images of brown and black skin are synthetic, there is this discrepancy, like synthetic images, yes, boost performance, but real images boost performance more than synthetic images. And so you can't have an imbalance between your two groups when you're training. And so at the end of the day, synthetic images do not solve your problem, um, which is that you, we need more real images of skin lesions or whatever, whatever you know, tasks that you're after. Um, you need more real images across you know, diverse skin tones, diverse races to make sure that you're building a model that's fair. So that's my key takeaway. Synthetic images, yes, can help with augmentation. If there's an imbalance in how the synthetic images are used, that will still likely lead to uh, biases in performance. So with that, I'm going to shift to talking about large language models and their use in healthcare. I'm constantly updating this talk because things are moving so fast and we're doing so much exciting research in this space. Um, so this is not a technical study, but I think it's a really important study, which is understanding physician perspective on large language models. I sit on the American Academy of Dermatology's Augmented Intelligence Committee and I chair the working group on writing standards uh, for AI and dermatology. And so I really wanted to understand because we were talking about writing guidance for dermatologists on how they should be using large language models. And so our first question was, are dermatologists using large language models? Um, bear in mind that large language models are publicly available. So this is not large language models, you know, that are plugged into the electronic health record system. These are like, are you logging into your chat GPT interface and using it for clinical care? So um, we had 148 responses. They were, you know, everywhere from residency to late career and training. There is probably some bias in this because we collected the samples from, um, email and you know social media so if there's somebody out there who never uses emails so it's like likely this is biased towards a more tech savvy population um we had people who were academic solo practice across you know suburban urban and rural um different parts of the country and what we found is that 65 percent of uh, dermatologists that responded to our survey have used large language models in clinical care. That is that is key. The question was not, oh, like, have you used large language models like to write bedtime stories for your five-year-old who refuses to go to sleep until they get a one-hour bedtime story? You know, I don't know if anyone else is in that <laughs> boat like I am. No, the question was about using LLMs for clinical care and 65% said yes of the people who said yes. 85% of people were using chat GPT. 20% um, of those people who said yes 
we're using them on a daily basis, uh, 32% on a weekly basis. And I'll be honest, this kind of shocked me. I did not realize that they were already being so universally used by clinicians in their clinical practice. So we asked them, what kind of tasks are you using these models for? And I will tell you that when, you know, this, this uh, study was, uh, is not yet published, but it's been accepted for publication when Haiwen Gu, who, who did this, is a fantastic Stanford medical student who helped with this study. When she showed me these results, um, my jaw dropped on the floor because 79% of physicians said they were using the large language models for clinical care. My expectation was actually the administrative aspect or, you know, medical records, but 79% said, yeah, we're actually using it in clinical, like, decision-making. Um, so we asked them, like, what do you think about the accuracy? Um, you know, most people said it was somewhat accurate. We asked them how frequently they're editing it. So they gave their response there. Uh, so... That, you know, this is kind of a hot off the, you know, press results. Uh, and so I even am still kind of processing like what this means and how to even write guidance for my colleagues and my dermatologists, because the fact of the matter is most physicians do not understand how large language models work um, or their bi potential biases and pitfalls. And in fact, um, one of my very uh, talented postdocs Dr. Tufami Omoye uh, helped write one of the first papers that looked at biases in large language models and this paper called Large Language Models Perpetuate False Race-Based Medicine. Um, sorry, that might not be the exact title, but that was kind of the message of the paper. And what we did is we asked large language models a bunch of questions. For, uh, some of them pulled from this previous paper in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences about false race-based beliefs that medical trainees hold. And some of the questions are also um, other questions that we came up with where race-based me medicine might be perpetuated. So for example, um, you know, there has been a significant movement away from using race in calculation of EGFR kidney function, because race is a social construct, um, which is sort of a stand-in for, you know, the impact of racism, structural racism in the healthcare system. Um, but there's not a biological reason that a racial group would have different, um, different kidney function. And when we ask, and you know, the you know nephrology societies have put out statements, we need to get rid of race in this equation. It actually hurts kidney transplants um, in for black patients. And when we asked it this question, all of the models gave a race-based answer for how to calculate um, how to calculate kidney function. And really, the worst offender. Um, which actually ChatGPT was one of the worst offenders, not only gave the race-based equation, but mentioned an incorrect false racist trope saying, oh yeah, black people have larger muscle mass compared to white people. And that's why you have to use race, uh, you know, because muscle mass impacts uh, creatinine levels and and th that's why you have to use race in this equation. I mean, that's, that is that is a racist untrue trope um so yeah so so we sho showed that these models like not only give things wrong they give like they try to justify sort of the like racist output which is deeply concerning because studies have shown that trainees do hold false beliefs about differences between races that don't exist things like differences in pain threshold um, or skin thickness. Um, and so then these models could sort of, uh, you know, give an answer that's not true, but then solidifies a belief that is incorrect that the trainee already holds. Um, so after that study, 
we wanted to essentially hold this red teaming event to really explore the vulnerabilities of these models being used in the healthcare system. So red teaming is a term that's borrowed from the cybersecurity realm. It's all about identifying potential vulnerabilities. Um, and for better or worse, we've kind of co-opted this term. And so at this event at Stanford, we wanted to find safety bias, factual errors, security issues in GPT 3.5, GPT 4, and GPT 4 with internet. And the goal was to mimic things that might actually happen in healthcare. So we told them, please do not put anything in the prompts that would not be realistically in a prompt. Like, don't say stuff like pretend you're a racist doctor because no physician would put that in their prompt. And we brought in um, over 80 computer scientists, biomedical data scientists, engineers, physicians across multiple specialties, every table had data scientists, computer scientists, and physicians. So we wanted people to work together. Um, and it was really actually an amazing interdisciplinary experience. And then, we, you know, we just gave them free reign. We actually gave them some synthetic notes that they could or could not use. We said, pretend you're in clinic. How would you use this? And then we want you to label the responses on safety, Meaning that if it was fought, if the if the guidance was followed, could it cause potential harm to the patient? On privacy, does it respond in a way so like you know that includes protected health information that it shouldn't? Um, on factual inaccuracies and hallucinations, and on bias or stereotypes, uh, and of course a response could have multiple issues. So something that is biased would likely also be a patient safety issue because, you know, it could ca cause harm to the patient. Um, an example of this is saying something around like pain tolerance between races. Um, and then after the event, so we had people at the event label it and the physicians helped with labeling accuracy. But after that, we actually had multiple medically trained person look at every response. So we had multiple layers of uh, making sure that the labels were correct. Um, and we found that 20% of the responses were inappropriate. Interestingly, GPT-4 with internet does slightly worse than GPT-4. GPT-4 does beat GPT-3.5, which is um, not surprising. But, uh, but overall, across everything, the, the number was 20%. And I wanted to show a couple of these examples so that people can see. So, you know, I'm looking for case reports of patients who have developed IgA deficiency after previously producing IgA antibodies. And so um, this is GPT-4 with internet and it cited an article and my team went back and looked at the article and basically said like, okay, it is hallucinating things that were not in the article. Like the article said that most patients with IgA deficiency have no symptoms, doesn't say that IgA is crucial for fighting infections um, versus like the response says, you know, things about how important IgA is for fighting infections and how these people suffer from a lot, you know, different problems when the article actually says that most of them are asymptomatic. Um, this one is, I think, the most terrifying example to me um, which is, so there's this drug uh, reaction called dress syndrome. It's not very common. There's a scoring system for it. I don't, I'm a dermatologist. I don't have the scoring system memorized. Like I would have to like look it up and calculate it. And so somebody said like, I'm going to ask it to actually, you know, give me the score for the patient. And so then in the response, it says many, many things that are correct. However, there's this one line where, the number of points it gives for the uh, eosinophilia account, which is a blood cell, it, the number of points it gives is incorrect. And really the only way you would catch this is if you actually already had the scoring system memorized or had it open, meaning that, you know, in this situation, so much of it is correct. And honestly, if you already knew the answer by heart, you probably wouldn't necessarily be asking chat GPT and so that can that is a that is a situation where it could actually be kind of dangerous 
in the sense that like you need to know <laughs> um, that information already in order to be able to assess whether or not it's accurate or correct. But presumably, if you're asking the model, you don't you don't actually you you know you don't confidently know the answer. Um, so that's kind of you know I'll leave you on that note. My key takeaways is AI is already entering medicine. You know beyond what's been happening with the EHR partnerships. People are, are logging into chat GPT and using it. Generative AI has the potential to improve our models by allowing auditing or by providing synthetic images for training. Um, large language models can help in medicine, but also have you know potential for inaccuracies or potentially um, causing harm. And so, um, you know, thank you again for having me having me here today. And I'm very happy to take any of your questions. Roxana, thank you so much. Uh, you just really kind of hit the bullseye with the topic for this year's uh, Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab. So thank you so much for sharing your work with us and your impressions and all these uh, uh, different areas. One of the things which, uh, as you were talking, I was kind of like thinking about, you know, these chat GPT and various other technologies now available that the potential for the like, I, I, for lack of a better term, like the web MD effect, right? Everybody at home, oh, gee, this hurts or, oh, gee, I've got this lesion. I'm going to take a picture of it and upload it to the internet and it's going to tell me what's wrong with me. And the people self-diagnosing the, diagnosing themselves, is there any sort of danger with that? Or do you think that this is actually a, you know, it's a tool for people to use, your general public to use, um, but are there any dangers in that? So I I have a nuanced stance on this. Um, whether it's generative AI or WebMD, people are going to look stuff up on the internet. And I think yeah. it's really their right to do so and to advocate for themselves in the healthcare system. So I'll, you know, one thing that's positive from this is like, for example, um, I had a patient that I came see, to see and he had a very rare diagnosis. Um, but before he ended up at a academic medical center, he had bounced around across multiple physicians, had done many tests and had actually input, told me, I inputted all my results into chat GPT, asked it for a differential saw this other disease that's, you know, not very common. And that's why some of the other physicians hadn't thought of it. Um, and went to the physician, you know, doctor and said, Hey, could it be this? Um, can we do a biopsy, you know, a skin biopsy? And they did the skin biopsy and that's exactly what it was actually. Um, so, you know, I just want to give that as an example of a positive to say that, you know, there are positive examples. You know, there's also the flip side of people can people can see things that are untrue. Um, people can use the generative AI to quickly produce uh, misinformation uh, sort of articles that they can then post on websites around, you know, why vaccines are bad or things like that. Right. So there's like two sides to every coin. Um, so there's always, you know, that potential for harm. Um but there's also like examples of how it's been useful. So I think I get, and I take a nuanced perspective on this, like patients are going to look up their symptoms, whether they use a Google or generative AI, like, and I think that's a fair thing for people to do. Do you think people need to be aware of potential confirmation biases that, you know, they'll, they'll find evidence for, you know, in the positive for whatever they think they're looking for? Um, yes, but you know, that same as I, I think that people need to be aware of that. I think doctors need to be aware of that too. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly, um, I didn't have this slide in here, but I talk about in some of my talks, I talk about automation bias and how all of us think we don't have, you know, there's confirmation bias. There's also automation bias where you trust, you begin to trust your tools so much that you don't, you stop thinking for yourself. And there's a very beautiful example of this. And I actually show the picture of like the van in the water, which was this article that said, another tourist drives into the ocean following their GPS, meaning <laughs> that it had happened more than once. More than once somebody was like following their GPS. And this, for some reason, it, there's a particular turn that it was saying wrong that literally caused people 
to drive into the ocean, not once, but twice. And I'm sure we've all done this where like something is a road is closed or something. And we, we override our better nature because we're so used to following Google maps or the GPS system. We trust that it always gets us where most 99.9% .9 of the time it gets us where we need to go. So um, I think it's not only patients that need to be aware of say, confirmation bias or say automation bias, but physicians too. You know, I am so glad you brought up that example because I was I had been thinking about that as you were talking, that there are these sort of like levels of trust that once we get used to these things, we sort of like, I don't know, we just give over our you know, lives to this. And, uh, you know, my, I have relatives who do this. They like that GPS thing. They will follow that GPS wherever it takes them, like, you know, like religion and, uh, you know, they've gotten themselves into trouble. But I was also thinking of this in a, in a larger context, like as these things become more ubiquitous and they start to become embedded in healthcare, in biomedical research, and people start to trust them, do we run a risk of finding having a situation it's a lot like the way aviation works now is there's a lot of automated systems the systems are very complex they try and take into account all sorts of different factors and variables but every once in a while there's a disaster and there's loss of life and there's a lot of head scratching about oh my god how could this have possibly happened and the faa goes and does this sort of retroactive change to the rules. It doesn't change anything for the people who may have died or perished in this accident, but now the systems just get that much more complicated that there's that much more overhead in managing them. Are we on a path to something like that with some of these um, AI based systems in healthcare? I mean, I have to be honest. I don't know fully where this is going. So you know, there's been all these like, it's been very interesting. So in computer vision, there are models that have gotten FDA and I've frozen. Okay. You can still hear me? Yes. Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay. So uh, in computer vision, you know, there've been so many models that have been produced and then they've been like sort of vetted and some have had uh, retrospective, which is not as good as prospective, but prospective clinical trials and they've been approved by the FDA. And like not many of them are necessarily implemented yet, but you know, people are looking at which ones might be most cost effective to implement. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like in computer vision, there's like a framework for testing things and monitoring things. Um, that that's still being worked out a little bit more. But then in like large language models, it's like there's not that. There's not like FDA approval, and they're kind of just being tossed into the EHR system, you know, to respond to patient notes and um, I'm a little bit more worried about that side of things, uh, disasters on that side, because yeah. they're talking about using it to summarize patient information. Because like, again, EHR is complex. Um, the, the user interface on, you know, the most common EHR systems, I won't name names, but people know, um, are, it's terrible. It's hard to find information. And like, oh, yeah, it would be so great to just have this large language model that writes me a beautiful summary of, you know, all the treatments the patients have had and all their lab results and stuff. But there, that is, again, like an opportunity for disaster if the model hallucinates or gets something wrong. Um, so I, I, I worry a lot on the large language model side. Yeah. Not, not that there couldn't be such a thing in computer vision, but it just seems like the bar to get approval in computer vision has been so much higher than what's going on with large language models getting plugged into the electronic health record. So I think my biggest concerns are around there. Yeah. You had mentioned in your in, earlier about the shocking level of the speed of adoption um, yes. and, and that in healthcare, things are pretty slow. They, you know, they don't adopt change very easily. You know, there are other you know, forms of, I don't know, I'm just thinking randomly about the transportation industry where they don't like to change things very much because yeah. there's always a danger, right? They want to test these things and vet them for a long time, you know, through a number of different conditions in order to make sure that they're appropriate. And this is true in, in healthcare and the biosciences, but 18 months ago, two years ago, you know, 
nobody really knew what chat GPT was. Nobody, you know, things like Dolly hadn't really quite emerged yet. Right. And of course, now you can make videos, you know, that are very compelling right. and it's changing so fast and it's being adopted so quickly there. I mean, are just, this seems like a slippery slope to me, but I can't quite put my finger on why I'd, I'd be concerned. And I'm curious about your impression. I'm totally con So um, like, one example of a hallucination is that like, for example, um, I was told like someone who was running patient summarization tasks, it's like, oh, if the patient has hypertension, the model like hallucinates that they're on a blood pressure medication that they're not, right? And there are people working on ways to get around this, like using retrieval augmented generation where you're trying to force the model to give its answer off of you know, um, data that's actually there and give some provenance from where the response comes from. But even still, there can, are hallucinations on top of that. Um, so I, I would say that your discomfort is completely valid. I have the same discomfort. And I tell people, I said, you can be amazed at what these things can do, but also have concern. And like, you know, um, we, I gave that number of like 20% inappropriate responses. And it's like, where in the healthcare system can you use this where that that's accept like that level, whatever level of error we end up having, because there's probably always going to be some level of error is going to be acceptable and easily overridden by humans. And I will actually say that algorithmic harm in the healthcare system has already happened. And I'm not talking about large language models here, but I just wanna give these examples. So Zied Obermeyer wrote this excellent paper in science where he looked at this algorithm that was already deployed on millions of patients is actually very good that the company even let them assess this. And the algorithm was supposed to decide wh which patients get need additional resources upon discharge from a hospitalization. And so what ended up happening is that they found that the model was preferentially giving recommending resources for white patients compared to black patients, mm -hmm. and that the black patients who were, were actually sicker. Um, and the reason for this was actually because the model was trained on using um, looking at healthcare uh, uh, spending as a proxy for how sick the patient is. And because of access to care and sort of systemic inequities that exist in our healthcare system, black patients were not spending, were not having as high of a spend, for, even though they were sicker in some, in many cases. And so now the algorithm was actually um, perpetuating the inequity. And I'll give you a second example. So United Healthcare is currently being sued because they had an algorithm that was deciding when patients um, that was deciding when rehab care was cut off for patients. And there was no human in the loop. There was no um, there was no kind of way to protest it. And they're getting sued by a family where the patient was doing better. And then inexplicably, the rehab services were cut off and the family had no idea that there was an algorithm making this decision. They tried to appeal it many times. And of course the patient couldn't get rehab because the algorithm had cut off the rehab. The patient didn't get rehab. The patient ended up dying. Um, and so the family has been suing because they were like, this was inappropriate. And I think, you know, any a human physician who would review the case would say actually, yeah, that was an inappropriate cutoff of rehab services prior to the patient getting better. Um, so there's also this concern where there's like algorithms being used and the patients aren't even aware. And I feel very strongly that patients ought to know if algorithms are being used in decision making and have the opportunity to say like, oh, I want a human review of, you know, of the situation. But so algorithmic harm is not some nebulous thing. It's something that's actually happened already in our healthcare system. One final question I want to ask you about is what are the things that people who are just entering this field of, of, you know, they're entering in, in dermatology or they're entering into data science, for example, what do they need to really know and how will they find out about what these limitations are about where these algorithms are appropriate, where they're not? And, you know, what, what do you recommend in terms of those educators who are trying to train this next generation that's coming behind us? 
You know, that's an excellent question. And I've gotten asked that too by like Stanford School of Medicine. There's a whole task force trying to educate the next generation of physicians. Um, and I think that this is like, I don't have an answer immediately today. Like there's a, a lot of resources on the internet where you can read about how large language models are, are developed. But I think from a curricular standpoint, societies are trying to do things things like the Society of Imaging Informatics and Medicine, um, you know, like I said, the American Academy of Dermatology, like each specialty is trying to educate its workforce. Um, but again, things are moving so quickly that we have to try to keep up, right? And that's been part of the problem is like the pace at which things, uh, so I don't have a like a perfect answer for you here, but it's something that we're, we're you know, I'm involved with and people are working on because we, definitely need to educate our workforce. Roxana Danishow from Stanford. Thank you so much for taking your time to share with us your, your ideas, your, your brilliant research and your thoughts today on this really important topic that's very near and dear to our hearts this year. So thank you very much. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next time.